Hello, my name is Dr. Cynthia McCullough, and I'm a diagnostic imaging physicist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Since 1991, I have specialized in X-ray computed tomography, commonly referred to as just CT. And I continue to be fascinated by the rich history of this powerful invention. I was also asked to give a brief introduction to the technology of X-ray computed tomography. Before there was CT, there was an exam called pneumoencephalography in which the patient was strapped into a chair and air was injected into the spinal column. The patient was turned upside down and side to side so that the air would bubble up into the ventricles of the brain. X-rays were taken at all these different positions to try to detect a loss of symmetry in the ventricles of the brain, perhaps indicating the presence of a mass. This exam has been described as a form of torture, which caused the patient a great deal of pain and typically caused vomiting throughout the exam, as well as severe headaches afterwards. It is not an exam that you or I would want to have. But before CT, this was the only way to detect large cerebral masses. CT began with the pioneering work of two talented individuals, one a physicist and the other an engineer. Alan Cormack was a naturalized American physicist who was born in South Africa, where he studied physics at the University of Cape Town. He furthered his studies at Cambridge and then became a professor at Tufts University. He mainly worked on particle physics, but his side interest was on X-ray technology. And so here and there, as time allowed, he worked on the idea of how one could reproduce the inside of an object by measuring attenuation line integrals through the object. He completed some of this work and it was published in the Journal of Applied Physics in 1963 and 1964, but the papers generated little interest. When Hansfield showed the first patient images in 1971 acquired with the head CT scanner that he had built, Cormack's work became of significant interest. Dr. Cormack was an honorary member of the AAPM. The invention of CT is perhaps most widely associated with Godfrey Hansfield because he is the one that built an actual device on which humans could be scanned. He started his career in the Royal Air Force in Britain as a radio operator but was so talented that he was quickly promoted to instructor and eventually they asked him to go and study to be an engineer. He led design teams at the EMI Central Research Lab outside London and became interested in computers and pattern recognition. He thought back to his early days of radar and how, with the knowledge of the signal bouncing back at you, one could identify an object. He began his work on the CT project in 1967 and the first patient was scanned using a prototype device on October 1st of 1971 at the Atkinson Morley Hospital in Wimbledon, England. My fascination with the history of CT is fueled in part by the role that Mayo Clinic, where I work, has had in the development of CT. The first commercial system, serial number one, was installed at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and on June 18, 1973, Mayo performed its first patient exam. One of the compelling aspects of this story, to me, is how closely Godfrey Hounsfield worked with radiologist James Ambrose to translate the technology that he had built into a clinical tool for the diagnosis of disease or injury. He was later knighted by the Queen of England and was properly referred to as Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. For their independent efforts, which were done half a world apart, Cormack and Hounsfield were jointly awarded the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. This is the first brochure for the EMI Mark I scanner installed at Mayo in 1973, and you can see that it cost $350,000 in 1972. The technical specifications are also shown, including the use of an 80 by 80 pixel matrix. The brochure included some interesting photos. I think that the control panel would be somewhat intimidating to most technologists these days. And the scanner had state-of-the-art floppy disk digital storage. However, I do have to question the wisdom of putting a picture of the service engineer fixing the scanner into a marketing brochure. This is an image from Mayo Clinic where we had one of the engineers from EMI, Dr. David King, 
posing as a patient for this photo. Also shown is Dr. Hilary Bud Baker, who is the radiologist who went to England to evaluate and bring back this revolutionary X-ray imaging device. X-ray technologist Daryl Holtz was taught to operate the complex system. Note that the CT scanner could only image the head. The patient laid supine with his head inside the cylindrical acrylic tunnel, which contained a water-filled bag to avoid saturating the detector as X-rays pass through the peripheral portion of the head and through air. This is another one of our technologists, Susan Rantham, demonstrating how the patient was positioned in the scanner. This is a picture of the scan room containing a lot of large electronic devices and a teletype printer. The images from the system were captured using Polaroid film and an entire CT exam consisted of six such Polaroid images. This scanner was actually the first multi-detector CT system as it acquired two line integrals at each position of the detector and gantry using two different sodium iodide detectors. These six images taped to a film jacket holder, comprised a complete CT exam of the head. The image on the left is from the first patient scanned at the Mayo Clinic. These images are of the same patient, who was scanned once in 1973 and again in 2003, highlighting the remarkable difference in image quality that the changes in technology had brought over the period of 30 years. The EMI Mark I CT scanner is on display at the Mayo Clinic, Fortunately, it was saved from the garbage dump on a few different occasions. Here is a photo of the system from when it was shown at the RSNA on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Radiological Society of North America. To our knowledge, the Mayo system and this scanner in the British Science Museum are the only two surviving EMI Mark I original CT scanners. Considering the success of the Mark I head CT scanner, the next logical step was to develop a scanner able to image the entire body. Again, Godfrey Hounsfield worked closely with James Ambrose to translate this new technology into clinical practice. This is a photo of them with the first body CT scanner, which was installed in three locations in the US. Now we will look at some early images. Here is an early CT image of the abdomen which although crude by today's standards, shows the interior cross-section of living patients. This had not been seen previously. Note the considerable amount of shading and motion artifacts. Here is an early image of the lung. The airways are not visible out to the edges of the lung. This is an example of state-of-the-art lung CT, shown here in the sagittal view. This was taken on a scanner capable of 250 micron image thickness along the z-axis. These are the specifications of a later EMI body scanner. Note that in the fast mode, a single scan, that is one rotation of the x-ray tube around the patient and hence one axial image, required 20 seconds. This image of the brain was considerably better than those from the first scanner and this image of the abdomen is also much better than in the first body CT systems. Here, the 20-second scan time is highlighted as a distinguishing feature of this fast CT scanner. Considering that the first EMI scanner took four and a half minutes to make one rotation around the patient, 20 seconds was pretty remarkable. Further, many patients could hold their breath that long, dramatically reducing motion artifacts. EMI produced a few more scanner models before leaving the medical imaging market due to a string of business failures. Further, they had considerable difficulty in competing with established medical imaging companies, particularly in the US, where action was taken to limit the importation of these expensive medical devices so that the domestic companies could successfully bring their own products to market. The EMI-77 scanner had a very interesting geometry in which the gantry ring rotated in and out of the plane. This was called a nutating geometry. Now, many other manufacturers developed CT systems. At one point, there were 23 different manufacturers of CT scanners, and several different systems are shown in the following slides. 
Picker stayed in the marketplace for quite a few years, eventually being bought out by Elsent and Phillips. As this 1981 brochure claims, manufacturers had arrived at the ultimate CT imaging system. In fact, during the mid-1980s, people considered CT to be a mature and rather uninteresting technology, and it was predicted that magnetic resonance imaging was going to replace CT and perform all future cross-sectional imaging. Here's a close-up of the patient alignment process. The plaid pants date the photo. Interestingly, in 1975, CT mammography was already being explored. A clinical evaluation was performed at the Mayo Clinic. Here are early breast CT images, which are nothing like what can be produced today, which can visualize both masses and calcifications. In the mid-1980s, Dr. Doug Boyd, a professor of physics and adjunct professor of radiology at the University of California in San Francisco, developed a technique called ultra-fast CT. In 1987, Mayo Clinic installed its first electron beam CT scanner, which was the first CT system to successfully perform cardiac CT imaging. These white areas in the image on the right are coronary artery calcifications. In contrast enhanced scans, however, the coronary arteries themselves remained very difficult to see. Skipping forward to 2006, Siemens introduced a dual source CT scanner which provided 85 millisecond temporal resolution and 40 imaging of the heart, including visualization of the coronary arteries and the cardiac valves. Now returning to 1977, the GE 8800 and most scanners from that era used xenon gas ionization detectors, which were very dose inefficient. In the mid-1980s, the manufacturers began to move to solid state detectors to reduce patient radiation dose. Even then, the radiology community was focusing on reducing dose for our pediatric patients. AutoView was a feature on the system console that required just one keystroke to start reconstruction. And data were archived on imaging tapes long before the development of PACS. Brain images were becoming better, as were sinus images, images of the chest, and images of the abdomen. This body image uses a 320 pixel squared matrix and although far inferior to anything we can see today, the scan time was down to 1.3 seconds to perform one axial scan of the abdomen. Then came spiral CT, the introduction of which restarted serious interest and research and development into CT technology. Introduced by Siemens under the direction of Dr. Willie Callender in 1991, spiral CT of blood vessels became common because the data could be smoothly acquired without stopping for patient breathing. Here is an example of a 3D rendering of a CT angiogram in the abdomen, and the image shows the maximum coverage along the z-axis for a scan in that era. At that time, scanners had only one detector ring rotating around the patient. In 1998, scan speed was dramatically improved by having multiple rows of detectors. This began the era of multi-slice or multi-detector row CT and initiated what became known as the slice race, where manufacturers kept adding more and more detector rows and data channels until now we have scanners with 320 data channels and half millimeter thickness that can cover 16 centimeters of the patient along the z-axis in one gantry rotation. Today, the coverage available for CT and geography is far superior. In this exam, a technique called dual energy CT was used, and with one click, the system is able to identify and turn off the calcium signal because the data processing done on the dual energy data sets could identify 
which voxels contained calcium and which contained iodine. Alvarez and Makovsky led pioneering work in this field. This is a picture of a spiral CT bone fracture. This is the type of resolution that we can achieve in bones today. This image shows a fracture of the wrist acquired using a photon counting detector CT scanner. These cerebral angiogram images were acquired in the early 1990s. With dual energy CT today, we can remove the bone with a single click and look at the circle of Willis in this high resolution image. We can also look at the vasculature of the brain with images of a quarter millimeter thickness. Here's a coronal image of the kidneys from the early days of spiral CT. This is a 3D rendered CT angiogram with coronal and axial images of kidney from 2016, where the use of decreased tube potential provided a 40 to 50% decrease in radiation dose while maintaining exquisite image quality. Two seminal papers are usually cited when talking about the dawn of CT. Hounsfield's paper discussing the technical design of the system and Ambrose's paper discussing the clinical applications. But in this first publication in the British Journal of Radiology, there was actually a third paper. Part three was written by two physicists and they were the ones that looked into the radiation dose considerations, which as we know, continues to be a topic of great interest in CT scanning. One of my predecessors at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Ed McCullough, who I'm not actually related to, was one of the first physicists to make dose measurements on the EMI Mark I system. In his early publications, he focused on the peak dose from just one rotation of the gantry. We've since come to realize that when you perform multiple scans, the scattered dose tails add up to what is called the multiple scan average dose. We estimate the multiple scan average dose with a quantity called the CT dose index, or CTDI, which is the integral under the radiation profile normalized to the nominal beam width. As CT technology has changed, the dose metrics have evolved also. I will explain some of these changes in order to compare the doses from the early days to those achieved currently. Ed McCullough and colleague Tom Payne surveyed many of the CT scanners that were available in the early years of CT and reported the maximum surface dose. While these values are hard to read, it demonstrates that they made measurements over many different scanner types and scan parameters. These doses are in RADS, so I've converted the values into milligray as is commonly used today. These values are the peak dose from one scan, and in some cases, the dose is reached up to 200 milligray. There were many different scan options, and this led to considerable variability in the doses delivered from a single scan. These data are from the historical records at Mayo and use just solid state detector CT scanners. The data show how the doses have been reduced over the years for an abdominal CT exam. The current average values for the volume CT dose index is more in the range of 12 milligray in 2019. Importantly, as these doses were decreasing, the image thickness was also decreasing. So the images were getting better and the doses were going down. So what are the technologies that have allowed this reduction in dose? Some of the techniques have to do with the system hardware, such as beam filtration and beam shaping, which remove photons that will not contribute significantly to the image formation, but do contribute to the dose to the patient. Beam collimation, particularly for the multi-size CT scanners, continues to be an important part of the technology in order to preserve dose efficiency. Education and software tools have also become available to set up the scan acquisitions in a way that is appropriate for a specific patient and a specific diagnostic task. 
This has helped the community to titrate the doses to the lowest levels, which still preserve the diagnostic information and allow the radiologist to accurately perform a diagnostic interpretation. CT detectors have also improved dramatically with photon counting energy resolving quantum detectors on the horizon. The detector electronics, for example, have become much more stable and have much lower electronic noise levels. Recently, dose reduction efforts have focused primarily on how to create higher quality images or images with lower noise levels. Image denoising and iterative reconstruction techniques are now in widespread use and the CT imaging field is poised to move into the era of machine learning and convolutional neural networks, which are going to take the doses down to a level that our predecessors could never have imagined. CT has certainly come a long way. It can image the entire body from head to toe in a matter of seconds. Anatomy is revealed in remarkable detail. And the doses used to acquire the data are in some cases, such as for low-dose chest CT screening, approaching those from conventional x-ray exams. I hope that you have enjoyed this journey through the history of CT, much of which still remains to be written. Thank you very much.